In this lecture, we will be focusing specifically on Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince. We've already discussed a little bit in class and in previous lectures the ideas of Renaissance humanism and the ideas surrounding the Renaissance itself. This lecture is going to focus just mainly on Machiavelli. Some background on Machiavelli. Um, the term Machiavellian has often become a byword for cunning, duplicity, and the exercise of bad faith in political affairs. Basically, if somebody in today's day and age calls you Machiavellian, it is not a complimentary term. Many people see this ideas, uh, the ideas of Machiavelli as one of the most dangerous threats to the moral basis of political life. But what we have to understand was the um, political context of Machiavelli's own time to understand why he is writing in this manner. Now, Machiavelli was born in Florence on May 3rd, 1469, um, or 68, it's actually kind of disputed. His father, Bernardo, was a lawyer, and because of this, Nic Niccolo was actually educated at the University of Florence. He worked as the second chancery from 1498 to 1512, and he was confirmed by the Great Council on June 19th when he was only 29 years old. Now, a chancery is a type of secretary, if you will. Um, what he developed in this was his diplomatic skills, and people in this position had to have a high degree in competence in the so-called humane disciplines, meaning the humanities. Now, what happens during this time period is as Machiavelli is working, it gives him a chance to study the great leaders of the past and to also see different leaders of his own time. And because of this, we'll see throughout the prints that he is very educated on this, and he'll use often examples from the past to illustrate some of his points, and even examples from his own time to show princes or leaders that were successful or ones that failed. An example of this would be in July 1500 when he actually went to the court of King Louis XII of France. Um, to the people of France, Florence's government appeared absurdly uh, weak and they looked at the, at the Florentine officials as basically weak and inept because they couldn't make decisions, they were always late on their decisions. And so Machiavelli actually warned the Florentine officials of this at the time, that this procrastination was making them appear weak to the rulers of France. And what he wanted was this bold and rap rapid action in both war and politics alike. Well, that didn't come about and France continued to look negatively on the Florentine people. In the autumn of 1501, Machiavelli married Marietta Corsini. They had six children together, um, and she basically suffered through life with Machiavelli. He was not a very uh, loyal individual. In fact, he had many affairs. However, she did outlive him by a quarter of a century. And 1502, Machiavelli travels to the court of Caesar Borgia, who was the Duke of Romagna. And you'll hear about him. We talked about him a little bit in class. Um, and Machiavelli often had a great respect for some of the things that Borgia did. And he says that he controls everything by himself, governs with, governs with extreme secrecy, and is capable in consequences of deciding and executing his plans with devastating suddenness. And he admired this in the ruler, that he was able to get things done, what needed to be done, even in times where it was very brutal, yet he still did it in a way that his people still followed him and often respected him. Now, during Machiavelli's time period, the de Medici family, had, who had been the ruling family of Florence, had been pushed out. But eventually what happened is that they re-entered the city and took control. In, on November 7th, Machiavelli was formally dismissed from his position and then sentenced to confinement within Florentine territory for one year. However, in February 1513, Machiavelli was mistakenly suspected of taking part in a conspiracy against the new government, and he was tortured and condemned to imprisonment and to ha pay a heavy fine. Eventually, what happens is that in February 22nd, 1513, um, Giovanni de' Medici sets out for Rome after Pope Julius II's death. On March 11th, he emerges as Pope Leo X. And while Machiavelli was not pleased with this, as an act of goodwill, Pope Leo X 
actually freed Machiavelli. So now Machiavelli has been freed, the ruling government has seen him as an enemy. So what he's now trying to do is his desires to show his usefulness to the Medici family um, and to obtain a new position. This is when he wrote The Prince, um, the second half is written 1513. And we'll see as it states in the dedication to the prince, it's dedicated to the magnificent Lorenzo di Piero de' Medici. Basically what Machiavelli is trying to do here is he's trying to get back into the de' Medici's good graces. And what he's doing is that he states in this dedication that princes, meaning rulers, are often gifted with worldly goods, such as horses, armor, clothing of gold, and precious stones. But Machiavelli says he has none of this, and his most precious gift is his knowledge, which he gives to Lorenzo. Yet Machiavelli himself says that he deems the work unworthy of your greatness. However, he claims that the truth of its matter and the importance of its subject should alone recommend it, basically saying that he's not writing something that's full of high-flown language. It's not all flowery and praising uh, the ruler. It's not trying to be overly flattering. But it's the truth from his own observations and study of history. Basically, what he's giving to Lorenzo de' Medici is an instruction guide of how princes come to power and how princes can stay in power. And now part of this, how the prince is set up, is chapters 1 through 9 are basically looking at how princedoms are formed. And what Machiavelli does in this is he talks about how rulers can come to be, but he limits it down so he's focusing only on one specific type of princedom. And interestingly enough, that's the type of princedom Florence is at this time. So his book is, ded is dedicated to the type of princedom that we see in Florence. And then the rest of the chapters, chapters 10 through 26, are how to rule and how to maintain rule, including examples from history. Now, I included on the previous slide here, there's a little video that I'd like you to watch. And what we see on this is this is just a general overview of Machiavelli ideas. But what we see in this is these principal concepts that the main role of the prince is to defend, enrich, and bring honor to the state. The prince must defend the state from both external and internal threats and to help form a stable government. Now, a prince should not be too soft, but should also not be too cruel. In other words, they should be un unapproachable, strict, but also reasonable. And then he asks the question, is it better to be loved or feared? Well, it would be great to be both as a prince. However, if a prince has to choose between the two, it is better to err on the side of inspiring terror. Why? People that are afraid of you will often do what you want them to. This tends to keep people in check. And then very central to the Machiavellian idea is the idea of virtue or virtue. And what this is, it's a combination of wisdom, strategy, strength, bravery and ruthlessness when needed. Machiavelli claims, and you'll see this over and over in The Prince, that sometimes princes must make hard decisions and sometimes they must be ruthless in order to maintain the rule. Basically the idea if you've got troublemakers in your princedom, you have got to eliminate them and sometimes you have to eliminate them in a way that is quite often brutal. And <coughs> Excuse me. This comes with this idea of what's called criminal virtue, where he states it's the ability to be cruel in the name of the state, but still be a good leader. That sometimes violence must be done for the security of the state. If this is so, it must be done swiftly, often at night, and should not be repeated too often. So, for example, if you have a group of rebels in your princedom and they are starting to form a revolt or an uprising, the prince must come in and absolutely destroy these individuals, often by very brutal means. And so, again, this has to be acted on quickly, done at night. Why at night? Not as many witnesses. And it should not be repeated too often. If you are going to continually act in a brutish manner, that will make you a tyrant, and that is when people will rise up against you. And so Machiavelli looks at these as ethical trade-offs, meaning this is real life. 
And in life, we have to make difficult decisions. And in sometimes, we have to make these choices that maybe we don't like either one, or maybe we know one is not ethical. We want to say, it's not ethical to go out and kill a bunch of people or kill a group of people. However, as a prince, sometimes you have to make that decision, that if killing this group of people is the only thing that's going to allow you to stay in control, then Machiavelli says, as the prince, you must do this. And he's saying, look, it's not pretty, but this is the process of dealing with the world as it is, not as it should be or the way we wish it would be. That these individuals who look at the world as we ought to see it or how we want it to be are not going to be successful princes for long. Well, what we're going to do in the next couple of slides is I have just picked a couple quotes out from Machiavelli to look at. Now, I am not going through the entire text for you, but I picked about uh, six different quotes to talk about here. And this is what I want you to do throughout the text is read through it and see what is Machiavelli saying, right? Why is he saying princes must act in this manner? So, for example, the first quote here. How we live is so different from how we ought to live that he who studies what ought to be done rather than what is done will learn the way to his downfall rather than his preservation. This is from chapter 15, and this is pretty much what I just said. That if we live in a world where we are only looking at how things ought to be, how we want them to be, and not the reality of how the world is, we're going to be in for a downfall. And this is especially true of princes. If you want to think blindly that all of your people love you and everybody's happy, because that's how you want it to be, or that's how it ought to be, that your most trusted advisors or people who are close to you won't betray you, what Machiavelli is saying, look, if you're going to believe all this, then you're going to learn your downfall very quickly, that you are not going to be in control for very long. It's this idea of basically get real. What ought to be is most often not what really is. The next quote, any man who tries to be good all the time is bound to come to ruin among the great number who are not good. Hence, a prince who wants to keep his authority must learn how not to be good and use that knowledge or refrain from using it as necessity requires. This is again from chapter 15. And so what he's saying, he, note, he doesn't say to be a prince you've got to be a bad person. He's just saying you can't be good all the time. Why? It's just not realistic. If you are trying to be good all the time, those are people are going to see it and they're going to take advantage of you. Why? Because the reality is, is a lot of people are not good all the time. So what must a prince do? A prince must know how and when it is time to not be good. Then they must use that knowledge to either act or refrain from acting. So the earlier example I used, you when you have the, the revolt that's starting to form, well, we would say you can't be a good individual if you order somebody's death. However, there are times when princes have, learn, have to learn to not be good, that they're going to have to do some action that is against the faith, the Catholic Christian faith, of the time. However, this is a political judgment, not a moral one, according to Machiavelli. If we try to make all these decisions moralistically, the prince will not remain in power for long. And then the next quote, men judge more by the eye than by the hand, for everyone can see and few can feel. Everyone sees what you appear to be, few know what you are. And this is from chapter 18. And so the idea of this is that people often only look at the surface. They believe what they see. Very rarely do we see people who are looking below the depths. And so what he's saying to a prince is that, you know, you, we can look at this in two ways. Maybe you are a ruler and you don't care about your people. But on the outside, you've got to make it appear that you do care about your people. Or take it the opposite way. Maybe you're a prince who is a good individual and you don't want to have to kill people or do things that may seem cruel. However, to maintain your power, 
on the outside, you have to make sure that your people know and understand that you can be cruel and you can be ruthless when you have to be. And that's what he's saying. This outward appearance is what people are going to see and what they see is often what most people believe. All right, next. The vulgar crowd always is taken in by appearances and the world consists chiefly of the vulgar. Now this one is a little depressing too. However, it kind of plays into today's political action if you think about it. There's this idea of this mob mentality. And what happens when you have these crowds together is usually they tend to resort to very base ideologies. And what Machiavelli is saying here is this vulgar crowd, they're again taken in by appearances. How you appear to them is what they're going to believe. So if you tell them that you're going to make their lives better and then you tell them who to blame, they're probably going to believe you. And then, kind of depressingly, he tells us the world consists chiefly of the vulgar. Right? This is definitely not complimentary, but sadly it is often true. So with this ideology, you should appear to be a good guy, even if you are not. Or, in certain times, you should appear to be the ruthless man, even if you are not. All right, next, men ought either to be well-treated or crushed, because they can avenge themselves of lighter injuries. Of more serious ones, they cannot. Therefore, the injury that is to be done to a man ought to be of such a kind that one does not stand in fear of revenge. This is from chapter 3. And this is another one that's a little bit ruthless. It's a little bit harsh to um, understand. So basically what he's saying, he's saying, look, as a ruler, there are going to be times where you are going to offend or hurt someone else. And he says, if you must do this, you must completely crush that individual. Why? Because if you only harm them a little, what can happen? They can recover, and if they recover, they're going to want revenge. Then you, as a ruler, then have to be fearful of them coming out and seeking their revenge against you. So, for example, I've been using the idea of a rebellion, of a revolt. So if a ruler goes and instead of completely crushing the rebellion, if they go and they capture some of the leaders and they only imprison them for a couple years and then let them go, that is a light injury. What's going to happen because of this? Well, according to Machiavelli, those people who were lightly injured are going to be able to heal, and then they are going to come back even stronger trying to seek the revenge. So the prince always has to be on the defense of these individuals. Machiavelli says it's better to just completely crush them in the first instance. That way you never have to fear them coming back for their revenge. This is one of those rules that is quite ruthless, but if you think about it, is very true. Think of every movie ever where somebody is not completely crushed. What do they do? They end up coming back and seeking their revenge. All right, and then the final quote we're going to look at. Princes must delegate difficult tasks to others and keep popular ones for themselves. Now this is from chapter 19, and the idea to illustrate this, I said earlier that uh, Machiavelli had this respect for Caesar Borgia, and what happens, this is an example of why he had this respect for it. So Borgia comes into power, but what he does is he hired mercenaries. These were men um, who, that you could basically just pay to be your soldiers. So he hires all these mercenaries to be, do all the dirty work for him, all the killings and everything. And then what he does, when the people start to be enraged and they cry out against these killings that are happening, what Borgia does is he takes the leaders of the leader of the mercenary and he has him killed. Basically, he literally had him cut in half in front of the people. So in the end, the people think Borgia did what was best for them. He saved them from the mercenary. 
even though the mercenary was doing what Borgia had told him to do in the first place. And this is that idea that Machiavelli says. The prince must delegate these difficult tasks to others. So he has somebody else literally doing the dirty work. So when you see the killings and the murders that's going on, you're not looking at the prince, you're looking at this other individual. And then when the prince steps in and punishes that individual, it then appears that the prince is saving you. When in reality, the prince was behind everything to begin with. So these are just a couple of the quotes from the prince that I pulled out. The text, as you're looking at it, keep in mind the idea behind it is that he is writing this literally as an instruction guide, as a how-to guide of princes to get in power and stay in power in the world as he actually sees it. And again, this was dedicated to the de' Medici's because he wanted to show to them that he was loyal and he was useful, and how better to do that than to give them the instruction manual of how they can remain in power. Now, many scholars have actually debated whether Machiavelli himself was Machiavellian. Did he really believe that this was how life should be lived, or was he writing this only as a political treaty, saying that this is the reality of the situation and that princes must do this to remain in power? You'll note he never makes a moralistic judgment of saying this is what I want them to do, but this is what they have to do to remain in power. And that's a question you can ponder on your own.